In 1775, the Continental Congress created the Chaplain Corps. Under the command of General George Washington, each soldier was required to attend worship service every Sunday. While other armies advanced on their feet, Washington's troops advanced on their knees. It's time for the Chaplain's Report with Caleb Colquitt on tactics. Chaplain's Report today comes from the book of Genesis. I've recently been reading through Genesis. Um, my church and I actually started a Bible reading program where we go through the Bible in a year. And so you might notice that some of my chaplain's reports coincide with that from time to time through 2020. And I was reading through Genesis 16 the other day, just to give you a little bit of context of how this is going on and, and what is going on in this story. Abram has now left home about 10 years ago, because when Ishmael was born, he was 86. When he left home, he was 75. Which means that when this episode takes place, it's roughly a decade after God called him to leave his home and to be a pilgrim and, and sojourn, uh, sojourn with him. So they've been waiting for a long time. And Abraham has, for a long time, been promised that his seed would be multiplied, that he would have a son, and that his son would come a great nation through all the worlds would be blessed. And with hindsight, we know, of course, that that means the Jewish people and then eventually the tribes of Israel, uh, the sons of Jacob, and then eventually all nations of the earth are blessed through the Christ. However, with Abraham, with Abraham, we're seeing this little episode unfold between him and his wife, and it really is one of the more interesting pieces of Abraham's history. And remember, this is back when their names were Abram and Sarai. So Genesis 16, 2 through 5. So Sarai and said to Abram, now behold, the Lord has prevented me from bearing children. Please go into my maid. Perhaps I will obtain children through her. And Abram listened to the voice of Sarai. After Abram had lived ten years in the land of Canaan, Abram's wife, Sarai, took Hagar, the Egyptian, her maid, and gave her to her husband, Abram, as his wife. Then went uh, he went into Hagar, and she conceived, and she saw that she had conceived. Her mistress was despised in her sight. And Sarai said to Abram, May the wrong done me be upon you. I gave my maid into your arms, but when she saw that she had conceived, I was despised in her sight. May the Lord judge between you and me. Now, this is a really fascinating piece of biblical history. But... I have to preface it by saying this. Dude, it's a trap. I mean, I, full Admiral Akbar here. It's a trap! How can you not see this? Your wife goes up to you and says, Hey, you haven't had a kid yet. Maybe what you could do is have a kid through my handmaid. Why don't you just go sleep with her and have a son? What man in his right mind, and maybe Abram wasn't in his right mind here, sees that situation and goes, oh yeah, that's going to work out great for me. I, <laughs> I know nothing about women, and I'm very open about that. I have no experience with women whatsoever. And even I'm smart enough to look at that and go, no, that's a really bad idea. Stay away. Danger, Will Robinson. Like wh Whatever warning I can give you, that is a situation you don't want to touch with a 10-foot pole. Yes, it was her idea, and I'm sure what's... Because, I mean, Abram is a man of God, but he's also still a human being. He's a man. And so what he's hearing is, oh, I can sleep with this other woman and my wife's cool with it? All right. No, that's a trap. And you should have known better than to be okay with that and just go along with it. And that kind of plays into my second... The second part of this, too. It would be real easy to look at the story and say, man, this is all Sarah's fault. She had the idea, and then she's the one that said, oh, I want you to be able to have children through my handmaid, and that'll be the way that you have children through, through her, and it'll be like having a child through me. 
And so Sarah's idea, it's her idea, then she's the one that gets mad about it, and then later on in this chapter we find out she is the one that is actually abusing, and we don't know exactly what level of abuse that goes to, but it was pretty severe based on the biblical context here, was abusing her handmaid. It's easier for us to look at as like, wow, Sarah should have never gone for that. She should have never had that idea. It was a stupid idea to begin with, and then when it did happen, she should have dealt with the consequences of it better. All of that is true. But here's the thing that sometimes people overlook when looking at that. Why did Abraham let Sarah make really bad spiritual decisions for his household? Because this is part of the divine nature. This is part of the divine understanding of how men and women are supposed to operate that goes all the way back to Adam. You'll remember, if, if you read back to Adam, this is one of the very first things that God tells men and women about the roles of men and women. Abraham is supposed to be the spiritual leader of his household, and he is falling asleep on the job here. What has happened is that Abraham is letting Sarah make all these really big, really stupid spiritual decisions, and he's just kind of going along with it because, hey, I get to sleep with the handmaid and all this stuff. And then when Sarah gets mad at him, unreasonable as it is, and it is, then all of a sudden, Abraham's just like, well, yeah, do whatever you want to with her. I don't really care. Abraham has completely neglected his role as the head of the household and the spiritual guide of his family. And this is even more true in a time where God's word was not pinned down. This is in the age of the patriarchs where God is speaking directly to Abraham. He's supposed to be the spiritual representation, the spiritual leader of his family. And he's just kind of letting Sarah do whatever she wants, whether it's right or not. I'm not saying that Sarah is not at fault. I'm not saying that Sarah should not have stopped this. What I'm saying is that Abraham could have ended all this before it ever started. If Abraham had been doing his job from the very beginning, then the first time that was suggested to Abraham, Abraham would have said, no, that's not going to end well. We're not doing that. By the way, God's promised me that an heir is going to come, and so we're going to do things God's way and not worry about it. I'm going to have an heir, and it'll come in God's time. I understand he's getting antsy. A decade is a really long time to wait for a human being. He's still operating on human time, and, and we all get antsy, and sometimes we, we make the mistake of feeling like we got to help God's plans along. That if God has promised us something, that, that we just got to, if we do it this way, then that will be what, what sets everything right. And if God has promised us something, that we just go with that. That's not how it works. You're operating on a human mindset. God promises us several things in the scriptures, and they will come to pass in his time. Sometimes God keeps us from certain things, and we don't understand why. We have to have enough faith in God's plan. We have to have enough faith that God cares enough about us to do what's right by us, to just do things according to his will and believe that he's going to work everything out. Abraham and Sarah, somewhere along the way, forgot that. And they certainly were not operating under that at this time. Both of them lacked faith. And here's really what this all boils down to is, we have been given certain roles, just like Abraham had the role to be a husband and a spiritual leader, and Sarah had the role of being a supportive wife, and, and both of them are falling asleep on the job at this. But faith has to accompany that too. You not only have to be in the correct role and operating under that correct guideline, but you also have to have faith that God is going to work those things out, that if you just follow God's plan, you listen to his law, you do what's right by him, you don't start making moral compromises to try to figure out how to make God's plan work out. He's God. He knows how his plan is going to work out. He does not need your help in that. I'm not saying that he wants us to be idle either. But my point is that if God wants something to work out, it's going to work out. What we need to do is to have faith in him and to trust him and to know that if we do what we're supposed to do, we uphold our end of the bargain. If we're following God's standards and living by his moral principles, that we don't need to worry about all the fine details of the plan. God's going to work those out for us. 
This is an example of where God would prefer obedience and trust to trying to, to fix a way around making God's plan work. That doesn't work. We need to fall into trust of Him, put our faith in Him, and that's what's going to make everything work out in the long run. Stay the course, friends. Just in case you were wondering, yes, I am a straight white Christian male and a small government constitutionalist, which means I have no chance of getting any help from the government and wouldn't accept their help even if they offered. Which means I'm going to need you to like and subscribe because my gun collection is not going to pay for itself.